Amen. Well, good morning again. Good morning. You'll be glad to know that we're not starting this week's sermon with a sing song um, like we did last week. But if you do have your Bibles with you, um, please would you turn with me to Genesis 40 and Genesis 41. And we're going to be following the story between these two chapters. Um, But before we jump into the text, it's important that we remember where we left off last time. And it's also important that the preacher has his Bible up with him. Um, That's always a good start. Um, But where did we leave off last week? Well, since the beginning of the year, we've been on a bit of a journey, haven't we, through the scriptures, this story that changes everything. Uh, And last week, we started within this series, a mini-series, if you will, on the life of Joseph. Not to be confused with Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus that we read about in the Gospels, this Joseph shows up in Genesis, which is the first book of the Bible. And there is much that we can learn and apply from his story and from his life and his encounters with God. Originally, this was going to be a two-parter, but Graham came up to me afterwards, after the service uh, last week, and he says, Pastor, I think maybe three weeks is a good idea. So, if it turns out not to be a good idea, it's his fault. But there we go. But last week, and if you missed it, uh, and you haven't had a chance, make sure to get caught up either on uh, our YouTube channel or our podcast on uh, Apple Music or Spotify, if you're savvy with that, and simply search McGee and Nazarene, and you'll find all the stuff there. But last week, we left Joseph in jail. His life hasn't been the easiest to this point, has it? His brothers jealous of their father's special affection toward him and ticked off by the sharing of his dreams with them. They throw him into a pit and they sell him off and they fake his death. It sounds like an episode of EastEnders, doesn't it? His father's distraught. The whole thing's a mess. The Ishmaelites sell him off to a guy by the name of Potiphar, the captain of the Egyptian guard. Uh, And Joseph quickly rises within his ranks. Things are looking up. And that is until Joseph continually turns down the advances of Potiphar's wife for some extramarital relations, which lead her to trap him and trick him, making false accusations about him to her husband. Um, And uh, Joseph ends up, as a result, being thrown into prison. From the pit to prison, it's not really a fairy tale story. It's not a very fun story. Yet even in the prison, we are told that the Lord is with Joseph and that he finds favor with the prison warden who makes him responsible for all that was done there. This prison warden had delegation down to an absolute art. Anything he didn't want to do, anything that he felt was beneath him, he said, Joseph, you look after that. You look after that. And it is at this point that we pick up the story this morning. Now, I wonder, what's the weirdest or strangest dream you've ever had? Right? A few funny faces being made at the minute. We've had, who's had a weird dream before? Who's had a strange dream before? right? Yeah, I think we we probably all have. I remember, this isn't my dream, but I remember a fellow who will remain nameless telling me that he had a recurring dream of being ate by a whale. Not because his parents read the story of the prophet Jonah to him at night, but because night after night his dad thought that he loved Moby Dick. So he kept reading the story of Moby Dick to him over and over again, well into childhood. He would have the same recurring dream of Moby Dick coming and eating him. Strange dream. Pretty weird, right? Psychologists, um, they would tell us that our dreams mean something as well. uh, And that it's the brain working, uh, the unconscious brain working in overload. Anybody ever had any of these following dreams? Anybody ever had a dream of being chased? Right? Yeah? We've all, thank you for your honesty, Stephen. Everybody else was like, "Mm mm-hmm, but Stephen was like, yep. Right? Apparently, if you have a dream about being chased, we're not addressing something or we're shying away from making a decision in our everyday lives. Apparently. Anybody ever had that dream where you fall and then you wake up just 
before. Apparently that means that there's something in our lives that feels very out of control in those moments. Anybody ever had a dream about being lost? Maybe, I, I used to have a dream as a child of being lost in a supermarket, but that's because I got lost in a supermarket, <laughs> right? But apparently if you have a dream of being lost, that is linked to having a feeling of being unable to make the right choice in a situation that you are facing. Anybody ever had a dream that they missed a plane, a train, or a bus before? Yeah? There's plenty of people who have that dream because it's happened, right? But if, apparently if you've had a dream that you've missed a plane, a train, or a bus, and of course because we have a Stena representative, we must also include the boat. Um, apparently if you have that dream, you, there is, it's because you feel that you missed out on an opportunity that had presented itself, apparently. Anybody ever had the, the dreaded dream of their teeth falling out? Right? This is linked to stress, apparently. Um, and it's uh, due to a fear of embarrassment or a loss of power, um, either in yourself or in a position of power as well. Now, Joseph was no psychologist, but whenever a few individuals in Genesis 40 and Genesis 41 had dreams, the Lord interpreted these dreams through him. Pharaoh, who was king of Egypt, we are told was angry with two of his officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And as a result, imagine having a chief baker. That sort of implies that you have lots of different bakers. That would be amazing, right? But his chief cupbearer and his chief, ba uh, chief baker, and as a result of his anger towards them, we're told that he threw them into prison. Now, it just so happened that this was the same prison in which Joseph found himself and the same prison which the captain of the guard had given Joseph authority over. So both of these men, whilst they were in prison, had dreams. Dreams which left them disturbed, especially as they felt that there was no one who would be able to interpret them for them as they were in prison. You see, in Egypt and in Egyptian culture, it would have been custom to call the magicians and to call the wise men who would then interpret, not the wise men who showed up in the nativity story, other wise men, right? And to call them to come and interpret what these dreams meant. But they're in prison. They're cut off from that. And this leaves them distraught and distressed. But Joseph hears about this. And after reminding them that interpre interpretation belonged to God and to God alone, Joseph asked them to reveal their dreams to him. Okay, so the cupbearer went first, and his dream went a little bit like this. In his dream, he saw a vine which had three branches. From this vine, there budded and blossomed and clustered grapes, which were tasty. We're then told that he went and he squeezed in this dream the grapes into Pharaoh's cup. But he was the chief cupbearer. He'd been cast out from Pharaoh's presence and he was now in prison. So what could this possibly mean? So as Joseph listens, he then interprets the dream to him. He says these three branches on the vine signified three days, three days which would pass, after which he would be restored to Pharaoh's side and would resume his role as the chief cupbearer. And we're told that the chief cupbearer was pleased with this news, right? You'd be pretty pleased with that news too. You're in prison and you're being told you're going to be restored to your position. So the baker, the baker hears that the chief cupbearer has got a favorable interpretation and therefore then he feels comfortable that he will go to Joseph too. And if it was comfortable for the chief cupbearer, it's going to be comfortable for the baker too. That's what he thought. So he went and he explained his dream to Joseph. In his dream, he saw three baskets. And these three baskets were piled up on his head. First of all, I'd be saying, don't eat cheese before you go to bed, right? But he's got three baskets that are piled up on his head. We're told that he, in that top basket, there was baked goods, which 
works out well because he's a baker, but that from this top basket, all the baked goods were being eaten up by the birds who were coming and pecking and eating away at it. Thinking there must surely be a decent explanation for this and a favorable explanation. After all, I'm a baker and there's baked goods involved, so that's going to be a good thing. The baker goes to Joseph, who interprets his dream. Just like the three branches, we're told that Joseph told the man that the three baskets signified three days. Super. Thumbs up. Great. But then we're told that the the basket full of baked goods that the birds were eating, that they signified how Pharaoh will impale the baker's head on a pole and that the birds will eat the flesh from it. That sounds like something from The Walking Dead, doesn't it? So you see two contrasting dreams and interpretations here, and things could not have been more different. The outcomes could not have been more different from one another. So if you ever have an opportunity to either be a cupbearer or a baker, you want to make sure that you're a cupbearer rather than a baker, don't you? Don't go with the obvious choice. But it was proved that Joseph's interpretations were correct. Three days later, on his birthday, Pharaoh, who was the king of Egypt, was holding a great feast to celebrate and called both the cupbearer and the baker to himself. We're told that the cupbearer was restored to his position whilst the baker was impaled just as Joseph had said to them in his interpretation. Everything was just as it should be, right? Just as Joseph said it would be. I'm not going to pretend that I understand why this happened to the cupbearer and why this happened to the baker. There's some theological thoughts around all of that, and you can go and read them yourself if you're really that interested, but I don't think they're pertinent to what the Lord has to say to us today, right? But whilst Joseph was interpreting these dreams, he said to the cupbearer, whenever he gave him the good news, he said, remember, remember me and show kindness to me by mentioning me to Pharaoh. See, whenever you get back to where you're supposed to be, see, whenever this interpretation is proven correct, make sure to mention me. Make sure to mention me. However, we read in Genesis 40 and verse 23, the the chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. That would really put you off doing something nice for somebody, wouldn't it? The chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot all about him. We're then told that after two years, two years, Pharaoh had a dream of his own. The story cuts off there, and then we jump forward two years. Two years later, Pharaoh has a dream of his own. So, as was Egyptian custom, he called all of the magicians and the wise men to his side in an attempt to get to the bottom of this distressing experience. But surprise, surprise, none could interpret for him. Then a light bulb went on, and the cupbearer who was by Pharaoh's side finally remembered. There's this wee fella, Joseph. He told me that it was everything from my dream and it came to pass just as he said he would if you have your bibles you'll read about it in genesis um genesis 41 9 to 14 it says then the cupbearer said to pharaoh today i am reminded of my shortcomings pharaoh was once angry with his servants and he imprisoned me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard Each of us had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream. And things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. 
I was restored to my position and the other man was impaled. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. He's been lying in that dungeon a long time and he says, I need a shave and I need a good clean. And then he goes to Pharaoh. Now, as the exchange took place, Joseph once again reiterated, as he had done with the cupbearer and with the baker, that it was God who had the power to interpret the dreams. And Pharaoh then proceeded to explain the following to him. Pharaoh had two dreams, and they were one in the same. The first dream saw Pharaoh standing on the banks of the Nile, the great river which ran through Egypt. And out of the river came seven fat and sleek cows. For city slickers like us, that's not very much. But Jillian's from the country, and Jillian's going to be showing the, the weans pictures of, pictures of cows today as she teaches them. Seven fat and sleek cows, perfect in every way imaginable. Then, after the fat and sleek cows, up came seven scrawny and ugly cows. I love that the Bible uses the word scrawny. They were seven scrawny and ugly cows. Then we're told that the seven scrawny cows ate up the seven sleek and fat cows. Right? Dream number one. Dream number two went a little bit like this. There were seven heads of grain which were full and good and everything that a farmer would have desired for them to be. After those were seven, seven heads of grain which were withered, scorched, and thin. And you don't need to be a farmer to know which one of the two you would rather have there. We're then told that the thin heads swallowed up the good heads of grain. Two dreams, similar stories, one in the same. And Joseph, after being told these dreams by Pharaoh, interpreted them as such. Your dreams are one and the same. The seven good cows and seven good grains are, signify years of abundance. Whereas the seven lean cows and seven bad heads of grain represent seven years of famine. You see, through his dreams and through the interpretation that Joseph gave, God had shown Pharaoh that which was about to happen. There would be seven years of abundance, followed by seven years of famine. And those seven years of famine would be so severe that people would forget about the seven years of abundance that had gone before. So Joseph seemed to have a bit of a good head on him. I would, I would say he had a good head on him because he walked closely with the Lord and exercised that sanctified common sense that we so often talk about. So Joseph advises Pharaoh to appoint commissioners, appoint officials who will do the following. Officials who will take one-fifth of the harvest of the seven good years. Each year, one-fifth of the harvest would be taken and it would be stored. Store up the grain under Pharaoh's authority to be held in the cities. In other words, store up the grain and it's got Pharaoh's authority over it. Therefore, nobody can touch it without Pharaoh's say-so. This food is then to be reserved, which is used during the famine. And as a result, the country will not be ruined by the famine which would come. That actually makes a lot of logical sense, doesn't it? It's a wee bit of forward planning. Some business people would call that strategy. It's good strategic thinking. And this plan is so pleasing to Pharaoh, that as a result, he places Joseph in charge of his palace. In other words, he puts him in charge of all of his affairs. Okay, this is a position of authority, which meant that there was no one greater in all of Egypt than Joseph, other than Pharaoh himself. This delegation of authority means that nothing can happen in Egypt without Joseph's knowledge and without his say-so. 
So this boy who found himself at the age of 17 chucked in a pit by his brothers is now one of the most powerful men in the known world. And we're told that Pharaoh is so enamored with him, so impressed with him, that he gives Joseph the name Zapinath Perea, which means God speaks and he lives. God speaks and he lives. We're told that at age 30, which is a pretty good age, by the way, if I do say so myself, right? At the age of 30, the same age at which Jesus started his earthly ministry, by the way, Joseph enters into Pharaoh's service, and during the seven years of abundance, Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain. In fact, verse 39 says, and Chloe read for us earlier, that Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain like the sand of the sea. It was so much that he stopped keeping records because it was beyond measure. You ever, you ever seen so much stuff or started to count stuff and you went, you started with all of the best of intentions and then you got into it and you went, you know what, there's loads. There's just loads. There's just loads. And this is, this is what has happened. And bear in mind that Joseph is storing up for seven years of famine, seven years of no crops, seven years of no grain, seven years of destitution. But he stored up so much that he's went, you know what? We're going to keep storing it, but I'm not going to keep counting it because there's so much of it. Now, if you're like me and I was sitting where you were sitting, you go, okay, well, I could have read all of that for myself. So how does this apply to me? But it's important that whenever we come to the application that we know the story that we're applying here as well. How does this apply to me? This is a wonderful story. And there is no doubt about that. But if it doesn't apply to us, it's just a story. It's just head knowledge. There's no doubt that God has done great things in Joseph's life and enabled him to go from that pit, which was temporary, and show him his love, which was from everlasting to everlasting. There's no doubt that God has taken Joseph from a prison cell to a position of power, and that the rise was unprecedented and would have left many in shock and awe. Probably none more so than Joseph himself. That's right, Kate, that is funny. But we don't live in Egypt. We don't live in approximately 1770 BC. We live in the 21st century. So how does this story apply to us? The first thing that we can learn from today's dive into Joseph's life is this, that it is in our obedience that the Lord brings clarity. It is in our obedience that the Lord brings clarity. Joseph rightfully recon rightly recognized that the power of interpretation did not lie within, but that the power of interpretation lied with him. Right? The power of interpretation did not lie with Joseph, it lay with God. It was the interpretations of dreams that led to Joseph being placed into the position of authority in which he now finds himself. But had he, had he have tried to interpret those dreams without the clarity of close relationship and the power of God at work in his life, he would have terribly failed and would likely have been impaled just like the baker was. He would have met the same fate, more than likely, as the baker. We're reminded in the book of James that every good and perfect gift comes from God above. That means that our giftedness, our ability, our gifts, and our talents, every good thing which we possess, it comes from God. He is the giver of life, he is the giver of personality. He is the giver of every good thing. Something that even Pharaoh himself recognized whenever he gave Joseph his new name, which means God speaks and God lives. God speaks and God lives. See, Joseph's obedience and dependence upon God brought clarity of thought, clear direction, 
and an ability to step into, with humility, the plans which God had for his life. I don't know about you, but so often it is my observation, either in my own life or in the life of, lives of other believers, that we want to jump right into whatever we believe it is that God has for us. And we attempt to speed up the process and circumvent the steps which are required to get there. Sometimes, as difficult as it may be, we would do well to remember that sometimes being in the center of God's will means sitting patiently in the prison cell. Sometimes being in the center of God's will means sitting in the prison cell for two years until the appointed time comes. Sometimes what we see as wasteful waiting is the time that God is using to set up and prepare the good plans that he has for us. Maybe you're waiting today. Maybe you're leaning on God. Maybe you're growing impatient and you're feeling the temptation and the pull to speed things up a little bit. But clarity doesn't come through speeding it up. Clarity comes through obedience. And sometimes obedience looks like trusting whenever everything and everyone else is telling you otherwise. Two other applications very quickly. And we see these through the names of Joseph's children. I'm going to read again Genesis 41 from verse 50 to 52. It says, Before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Asenath, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh. You're not going to see that in maybe many baby books, are you? But he named his firstborn Manasseh and said, It is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. The second son he named Ephraim and said, It is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. Now, I don't know if you know what your name means, um, but we took great care whenever we picked our kids names um, there was there was great thought went into all of these uh, and they're named different things for different reasons but for my kids Annie means grace or favor Sophia means wisdom and Catherine or Kate means pure which means that she's not going to go anywhere near any boys ever <laughs> right but grace or favor wisdom and pure or purity but joseph names his sons manasseh and ephraim he named his firstborn manasseh because god has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household manasseh literally means forgetfulness right and and if you were me and you just found out your name meant forgetfulness you'd be a bit like what right? What, what's the application of these names? Everything that is in Scripture is God-breathed. Everything that's in there is there for a reason. So why is this detail there? We read in Isaiah 43, where God says through the prophet to the people of Israel, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Was this not Joseph's story? Was this not Joseph's story? See, the reason that so many of us do not fulfill and live in God's will for our lives is, that we're, is because we're too busy holding grudges or we're too busy clinging to past hurts and allowing our past to dictate our future. See, our God, who is the God of new things, calls us to himself today, and his plans are to prosper and not to harm, to give us hope and a future. You see, if Joseph had have mentally remained in that pit or had have mentally remained in the prison, he would never have been used mightily by God. And the same goes for you and for me. So maybe the word of the Lord to us today is get out of the pit. 
let it go and give it over to God, whatever it is. Forgive what needs to be forgiven and step into that which God is calling you in this time and in this season. Serve him. Serve his church. Work for the extension of his kingdom here in East Belfast as it is in heaven. Press on and press into God and his plans for you. And his warning to us today, I believe, is don't get left behind. Don't get left behind clinging to stuff that you were never supposed to cling to. Stop being miserable. And believe that he who started a good work in you will bring it to completion. He's not forgotten about you. So don't get left behind. I love these words from the Apostle Paul and they just keep coming up in my personal reading and my conversations with individuals. Philippians 3, 13 to 14 says this, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Right? Forgetting what is behind. Who here has ever made a mistake? Who here has ever been hurt? Who here would have loved to have punched that person in the face? Right? Maybe you shouldn't admit it in church. Right? Stop living there. It's done. It cannot be changed. But it need not determine where you go in the future. God has made me forget all my trouble and my father's household. Then his second son, he names Ephraim. Ephraim. Again, not a name that's in your typical baby book, but he gives him this name because he says, God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. Ephraim literally means fruitfulness. Manasseh was forgetfulness. Ephraim is fruitfulness. The reality is that with the help of God, it was the suffering which Joseph endured that made Joseph into the person that he was called to be. There is no such thing as wasted experience or wasted time in God's economy. God may not cause the trial, God may not cause the hurt, but there is no such thing as wasted time or experiences in God's economy. Peter writes in his first letter these words which are so famous that you could, many of us could probably recite them word for word, but I'm going to read them. 1 Peter 1, 3 to 9, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all forms or all kinds of trials. They have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Your trials and your sufferings are not punishment from God. Maybe you need to hear somebody say that from the front. Your trials and your sufferings that you have endured or you are enduring, they are not God punishing you. God did not cause them, but the God who turns all things for the good of those who love him will use them to bring about fruitfulness, favor, and genuine faith in your life 
if only you'll let him. But in order to live in the blessing of Ephraim, we need to live out the reality of Manasseh. In order to walk in the fruitfulness, we, have, we must first walk in the forgetfulness. Forgetting the former things and pressing in to all that God has for us. That we may be conformed to the image of Christ and serve him with gladness. If you've ever went through hard times, if you are going through hard times, when you go through hard times in the future, a word of comfort that was given to me by somebody else was a a phrase which was used by Oswald Chambers, a great preacher and theologian of old. And this applies to women as well. It says, before God can use a man greatly, he must first bruise him deeply. Before we can be used mightily by God, we must trust in him because we have nothing else to trust in. Before God can use a man greatly, he must first bruise him deeply. Your suffering is not and will not be the end if you give it over to God. Because as Billy Graham famously stated, the will of God will not take us where the grace of God cannot sustain us. I'm going to say that again. The will of God will not take us where the grace of God cannot sustain us. So hold on. As it was with Joseph, may it also be with us. That in our obedience, the Lord would bring clarity that God would cause us to forget all of our trouble and that God would make us fruitful in the land of our suffering. Amen. Amen. As the praise team come, let's pray together.